I came from a small town. I was actually a small town lawyer for five years. Um, I started with a small firm. I ended up uh, with my own practice and, and had a couple of associates. Um, I was really, really good at coming up with the theories for things, but I hated litigation, so I thought, I'm going to go to get an LLM. I'll go back. I'll teach in the law school. I'll represent my oil and, oil and gas clients, and that never happened. I went to New York. I got the LLM. They said, you know, before you go back, you should practice law uh, here, and I did that uh, 25 years later. Um, I was retiring. I had been a partner in uh, major uh, uh, Wall Street and international law firms. I represented all the banks. Uh, I was in structured finance and derivatives. And then I had the opportunity to go to the CFTC to help set up uh, the swap dealer uh, oversight uh, 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 division. And so I thought, you know, all right, let's do that. That'll be very interesting. And I did that for three and a half years. And then I went over to the SEC. Um, and um, it's been interesting as well. Um, I do think along the way, one thing I wanted to mention is the importance of mentors. Um, and we talked to, I heard somebody talk about relationships, and that's hugely important. You've got to keep them up. But um, some of the mentors I've had in my career, I'm just so deeply grateful to. We were talking, I was talking to Richard before, many, many years ago, um, even though I had my own practice, I still would hate to get up in front of a crowd. So when I got to New York, I was very good um, just, you know, going way back to college. I started in physics. I ended up in philosophy. I was very good with math and so on and very good with cash flows and um, sort of an idiot savant with them. And anyway, I was very good with that stuff, but, you know, very shy about getting up and speaking. And I had a mentor who said to me, Gary, you need to overcome this. And he sent me to overcome it. He sent me to Dale Carnegie or something, you know. And along the way, I've had mentors that have helped me in certain ways and growing and developing. You've got to keep changing. And a lot of the advice we've gotten from the other gentlemen are just so absolutely true. I do know I was a partner at Sherman and Sterling, was one of the firms I was at. They had been a firm that had a very historic long-term relationship with a particular bank, and that ended as it did for many others, and they had to, you know, become like many of the other firms. And the, the point being that with that change in that worldview, that created opportunities. The intense competition and so on gave opportunities to folks like me who could then come in and uh, compete and succeed. So that's all very important stuff. Um, some of the words I heard, you know, flexibility, humility, um, watching trends, um, but hard work, you know, really busting your butt, um, working really hard. Creativity, I heard that. That's hugely important that Morgan was talking about. Um, again, the um, looking for trends, having a bigger view, um, watching what's going on on the horizon, looking for those opportunities. So I would emphasize all of those. Um, the one thing I wanted to add from my perspective as a, as a regulator, um, just get my page going here. Now my original, my original talk, I was going to talk about decision making. And the basic paradigm is basically, you know, we really only live, the past is kind of a concrete thing behind us, you know, and the present, we're always in the present. And we use our imagination, which goes back to the creativity, the novelty, and so on, to imagine what we're, where we want to go, and we make choices. And that, you know, you roll a rock, and it just kind of, you know, it rolls. But for us, we look at our options, and we make choices. And you've got all kinds of things you can do around you know, analyzing, do you see all the options that are available to you? Can you see all the consequences? Do you know where you are, where you want to get going, and so on? And so I wanted to talk to you about some of that. But instead, I want to plug into that, and I want to then talk about um, decision making, and I'll just say from the regulator's perspective, to just start there. And we're hearing about, we're in this very transformational uh, time. And what is the regulator's perspective in the face of transition and transformation? Um, can a regulator just say no in the face of that? I mean, it's coming, the future's coming at you. It's like this stuff is, it requires a lot of expertise and it's complicated. And can a regulator just say no? What do you think? There's no upside in saying yes, some people used to say to me. You realize you, the regulator can't just hold still, right? We have the best markets in the world. And if we're going to maintain them, we have to move forward. There's no saying no. But on the other hand, the regulator, so the regulator has to be an enabler, but the regulator also has to, their mission is to hold the quality and protect 
investors and you know hold to the, help preserve the quality of the marketplace. And so there's a mission there that has to be preserved in the face of change. And so there's this very significant tension that the regulator faces when they're addressing that change. It's not helped by the level of uncertainty. I mean, there's so many unknowns. You don't know where it's going. You don't know how this thing works. Somebody brings you a technology. How do you understand the technology except unless you've got a very um, uh, kind of tight use case where you can analyze it in that context? And then let me flip it around. So I just want you to understand. So that, that's the, the regulator's tension and what their mindset is. They know they can't not do anything. They know that they have to, they're being pushed forward. They want to preserve the quality and they want, and one way to do that, only way to do that too is to enable these things. But if you make a mistake and something happens that you didn't understand or you didn't catch, then you're gonna be in big trouble. You didn't wanna create a problem, plus you get you know, punished for that. On the other hand, then what can we say about um, your side of things? Then how do you interact with the regulator? Mm -hmm. And I think a very important part um, realizing is to, to realize where your regulator's mindset is. So, you know, um, one thing that's really critical is, and I know this is very hard, there's a, always gonna be sort of a tendency, do I tell them that, do I not tell them this, can I get away without saying that? And by the way, I was, since I was, in the, I was in the private side for 30 years, I mean, I kinda got paid to, you know, figure out how to get things done without creating a lot of friction, you know, I was very successful at it, I get that. On the other hand, we are in a place where, how does a regulator really understand this stuff? And if you want it to move, um, how do you get it to move without being, you know, helpful enough? And if you hold back too far or mislead in some way and break trust, um, you not only have a problem in their particular case, but you could have a career problem. And I'll tell you, there are people out there um, that when we're talking, we just, there are certain people we know and we just take for granted that you know, we've had issues with them and when they cut their credibility is very hurt. Um, and they, they are the ones who hurt it. Um, there are others who have gotten sort of the moral high ground. We try to help, you know, them. We gotta try to help everybody. But I'm just telling you that there is an impact um, by how well they'll interact with you and, and help you and all of that. Um, another tension, I'll, um, I will, and I'm not sure where I'm going time-wise here, I don't see a clock. Um, another point I'll talk about, uh, the intersection of uh, new technologies with legacy rules. And, um, you know, one thing that makes the regulator frustrating, I understand this, is um, you, you can't really revise a rule ahead of time, right? I mean, you, until you get that use case, and until that thing comes in and you study it, then, and you understand, you, you're, in a sense, you're not only trying to repair a wing on a plane while it's flying. In today's world, we are actually redesigning the wing while the plane is flying. And while you're re redesigning part of the wing, you've got a legacy part of the wing that's holding you up. You've got a legacy piece that they say will make it even better, but you're working on it, and your rule has to cover the old and the new. And so you've got to make that work. Um, in a sense, you see what's happening is the technology has been, um, has been out there, people have learned about it, they're now putting it to use, and then they come to the regulator, and you now have, you in a sense are a point of resistance because you've gotta make this net thing work for the new thing that other people have been working on. So that is a dynamic that's um, frustrating for everybody. Um, so I think that, um, Maybe understanding that uh, is important. And of course, there's other dynamics as well. Like you don't want to wait too long and you come in with a product and then you've got something that doesn't work from a regulatory perspective. And you know, well, you got to go back and redesign it. Um, on the other hand, if you come in too early, there may not be something that, you know, may not be developed enough for the regulator to be able to help you. Plus, the regulator cannot be your lawyer. So there's these kind of dynamics um, that you have to be aware of. And one thing that we encounter a lot with the technology side, and, um, and it's not typically in New York or with the big banks, but there are a lot of new things that, um, that where the technology folks, some of them have failed to realize that there is a regulatory world out there. And so then 
they come and they finally meet that um, and they're surprised and then we're kind of surprised too. So in any event, I just wanted to um, take the opportunity to, um, I've heard wonderful uh, uh, tips from folks in the business and as a regulator, I then wanted to add this perspective uh, for you and I hope that's been helpful. Um, just last point, um, I do care very much about you all. I've just I've let you know I've got a 26-year-old son and a 23-year-old son um, and I um, uh, kind of know kind of where you're at and I'd, I'll wish you the best uh, in every way. So thank you very much.